guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we talk to people who are creating and building a better future. Today, we've got somebody who's been doing that for quite a while in a heck of a lot of different ways on the program. Howard Bloom, we got the technology working. Thanks for coming. Oh, it's a blessing and a pleasure to be here, Matt. So you've, you've worked with Michael Jackson. Now you're trying to colonize Mars. And I want to say you've done just about everything else in between. Can we get a quick 30,000-foot 30 overview of you and what it's like as an ADD polymath-type person that tries all of these different challenges? Well, I started in theoretical physics and microbiology at the age of 10, of all things. Um, I, I built my first Boolean algebra machine when I was 12. I co-designed a computer that won some science fair awards when I was 12. And I realized, and I had my first meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo when I was 12 to discuss the interpretation of the Doppler shift, which was a hot topic at that point. And then I realized that what really fascinated me, or at least one of, first of all, I wanted to grasp every science I possibly could. I have a limited brain. Some sciences I can get, some sciences I can't. I wanted to take them all in a big bundle, like a big bouquet, and use them as a lens with which to see the grand panorama, the big picture that specialists were missing. And I wanted to see where the human passions fit into that. I wanted to see where the gods inside of us, those things that take us over from time to time, make us ecstatic, become part of the forces of history. I wanted to see where those intoxications, um, those mass exhilarations um, fit in. And so when it came to grad school, I had fellowships at, in four different universities in cognitive neuroscience, and I dropped out, and I went into a field I knew nothing about, popular culture, and I founded the biggest PR firm in a field I knew nothing about, uh, rock and roll, the music industry, and I worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Smith, Kiss, Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, David Byrne, people like that, Run DMC, often helping whole subcultures find a voice and, and make a statement in society about their right to be. And that was the land of the gods. That was the land where these ecstatic fashions come out in the people. They come out in a rock concert. It's called getting off in a rock concert. And then in 1988, I got sick. And it, I, I was stuck in a bed for 15 years. For five years, I was too weak to talk and too weak to have another person in the room with me. And it was a fortunate occurrence because I needed to go back to my science. I was already half finished with my first book at that point, The Lucifer Principle, A Scientific Expedition to the Forces of History. And since then, I've, uh, while I was sick in bed, I wrote three books and I founded two international scientific groups. And, and since uh, I left the music industry, I've published, I've either published in peer reviewed journals or given lectures at scholarly conferences in 12 different fields from theoretical physics and cosmology to uh, evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology with a whole lot of other stuff, information science and all kinds of things, biopolitics um, in between. But the goal has been to show you the big picture in the best way that my mind with its ADD, uh, that my mind could take advantage of that ADD and make it a virtue. This is pure speculation, but how much did LSD and psychedelics play into wanting to explore that bigger picture? You were in the right well, era. You were with the right people. I'm curious. Well, um, I took those things. Remember, I had a book called How I Accidentally Started the 60s about how I accidentally helped start the hippie movement. But in fact, what happened was I got a job at the age of 16 at the world's largest cancer research lab. And they put the Russell Park Memorial Cancer Research Institute in Buffalo, New York, my hometown, and they put a scientist over me to make sure I didn't break too many um, uh, radiation counters and too many photospectrometers. And he took me into his office and he showed me his desk. It was about six feet long and it had stacks of books. And he said, see all those books to the left um, or to the right? Those are books that I finished. By the way, all these books were in German. And they were stacked six books high. And then he said, see the books to the left? Those are books I haven't even read. Until I've finished all those books on the desk, I will not be able to synthesize the molecule I have been working toward for the last three years. It'll take me another two years. And I thought, this is not the kind of science I want to do. I don't want to dig a hole so deep that I can't see the sky. Um, 
I don't want to become a specialist who can't see anything beyond his range of specialization. I want to fly over the landscape like an eagle and see the whole thing and take all those little gopher holes from the specialists and use them as pixels in the big picture. So that realization happened when I was 16 years old. Then when I was 19 years old and 20 years old, I accidentally helped start the drug revolution and took LSD twice, took peyote twice, um, took uh, methadrine twice, and then never took them again. But they did open doors of perception, no question about it. But I was already on the track of finding the infinite and the tiniest of things from the time I was about 14 years old. It's really, you can get general or you can get specific with things. And I feel like that's a lot of times the differences you see between people are how much they generalize and look at big picture and how much people get into details and focus on optimization. How do we think about dealing with that where we are living in a world where people do get caught in the forest and they can only see the trees because well, they the, are so in depth? The answer is follow your curiosities. Um, you know how when you go on uh, Google and are searching for something, your eye is caught by things that are not relevant to the hunt you're on at the moment. You have to be able to do two contradictory things simultaneously as a phrase, a bloomism, opposites are joined at the hip. You have to be able to discipline yourself to drill down to the topic at hand and not let your distractions um, keep you from achieving your goal. But at the same time, you have to be... There are some results from a search. No, God, Google is trying to talk to me. It thinks we're searching for something. Oh, well, at any rate. And that, therein lies the problem of being too general. Sometimes you miss the yes, topic. But, but you also have to not kill those curiosities. Later, when there's time, when you've done your work, then follow your curiosities. Because the more, the more fields you have knowledge of, the more of a big picture you can assemble. And to assemble a big picture is a, a major, it, it's a very important thing. Um, for, uh, to give you an example, I appear on a show called Coast to Coast. It's the highest rated overnight talk radio show in North America. It's on 545 radio stations. I, tonight I have my 314th appearance on the show. And they have assigned me covering the impeachment. Well, that, uh, and they had me on for a two-hour debate a couple of weeks ago with a, what they call a right-winger. This is a Republican show. I'm their token Democrat. I'm their token liberal. Um, so we had a slam-bang um, debate, but it took a, a week of research. That took drilling down in a very specialized area and getting every conceivable detail. But then you can pull, if you know a lot of disciplines, you can pull out and see where the impeachment stands in the big picture, at least theoretically. I mean, some of us, and I have a tendency to get so drowned in the impeachment that I lose the big picture. But it's a matter of opposites are joined at the hip, but being able to do seemingly opposite things pretty much simultaneously. Um, does that at all answer the question? It does. This isn't at all where I plan to take this, but how do we deal with the fact that school is designed to drill that ability out of us? At least that's what it feels like from a big picture perspective is that school is designed to create someone who's very good at one specific thing. And we see people well, losing that ability to go across to disciplines. Well, I'll tell you how I did it. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for others. At the age of 10, I became addicted to books and started reading two books a day, which means that I read one book under the school desk every day and never paid attention to my teachers, never at all. I did not learn where Nebraska was. I didn't learn what a gerund was. But by the time I hit fifth grade, I had a higher, uh, I came out higher on a uh, vocabulary test than my teacher. And then I did something highly unconventional and skipped out of grad school. I didn't go um, and became an expert in the field. Well, actually the star making machinery. How to take an unknown like Prince or like Joan Jett, these 19 year olds, who had tremendous talent and ate, slept, and breathed their music. And I learned how to make them stars because they deserved to be stars. It wasn't as if I was creating it from scratch, not by any stretch of the imagination. Take unconventional routes, but not everybody can do that. So the answer is read, follow your curiosities. Yes, let them drill a training into you. One day I was at the cafe where I write my books. And a woman was sitting next to me who turned out to be the um, electronic books editor 
for Oxford University Press. And she said, what field are you trained in? Now remember, I've published four given lect scholarly lectures in 12 different disciplines. And I suddenly realized I'm not trained in anything. I never underwent what you undergo in grad school where your, uh, your supervisor tries to make you an arm, a servant of his own work and trains you in narrowing down just to follow the next tiny little incremental nudge forward of his work and thus narrows you and trains you to be narrow. Well, I've never had to do that. Now, I wouldn't recommend jumping ship, which I've done in, in many ways. Um, as a way of life, but if you can do it, if you can pull it off, if you can keep from drowning, it's the most magnificent thing in the world to be an outsider in every field and to be able to splash down um, as a creature from another planet and assume leadership positions, which somehow I accidentally seem to splash into. Yeah, you find this a lot with startups and disruption where the people that disrupt the fields are the ones who didn't come from within it because they don't know what they can't do and they don't know the rules and ways that things are supposed to be done. That's exactly what happened to me with rock and roll. Um, I, came, I came to rock and roll with the mindset that I'd been given by reading the Scientific American from cover to cover when I was a kid and most specifically Martin Gardner's mathematical game section. So I put together simple correlations to see what works and what doesn't and discovered that there was a whole bunch of rituals, a whole bunch of traditional ways of doing things in PR, public relations, in the music industry, that didn't seem to be at all effective and in some cases were counterproductive. So I abandoned all of them and developed my own ways of doing things. And the result was I was credited with uh, reinventing what PR is in the music industry. And it was devilishly effective. Look at our rate of taking unknowns and putting them on the cover of Rolling Stone. It was ferocious. It took three to four years to build up to that point, but it was ferocious. So yes, splashing down in the field that you don't know, if you're willing to dedicate yourself to it, like a Talmudic scholar, study it upside down, backwards and forwards, um, then yes, you can benefit tremendously from your outsider status. What's the status of the publishing industry, PR, and music industries today as we see a shifting landscape, so to speak? Well, one of the difficulties is um, that what I, if, if you came to me as a potential client, I sat you down and said, look, if you expect me to create an artificial mask for you, um, to create a facade, in other words, to create an image, then I'm not the publicist for you. You have to understand that music is an exchange of soul. Music comes from the gods inside of you. It comes from forces in you that you don't know. When you sit down at two o'clock in the afternoon in front of a blank computer screen to write a lyric, you are absolutely certain you can never write a lyric again, and you have no idea of how you've ever written a lyric in the past. On a good day at four o'clock in the afternoon, there's a lyric in front of you. On a really good day, that lyric is so perfect that you feel it wrote itself through you. When you go on stage, um, and it's a really good night, and you see the pupils of the audience dilating, and you see their faces melting, and their energy starts pouring through you. You are danced as if you are a marionette on a string. There is a force that goes through you from the audience, is transmogrified somewhere in you, and then flows back to the audience, and you have an out-of-body experience. You see it all as if you were on the ceiling, looking down. Well, my job, I would tell you, is to find that self inside of you, that God inside of you that wrote those lyrics. It's to find that God inside of you that dances you on stage. Those are your soul. And when you are on stage with that audience's energy flowing through you and then being uh, flowed from you back to the audience, soul is what it is all about. So if you are willing to let me find your soul and introduce it to the self of, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much. Um, I'll work with you. If you don't understand that music is a soul exchange, if it doesn't resonate with you, then I'm not the right publicist for you. Now that focus on soul, not product, not marketing, not branding, not any of these dehumanizing terms, the most human experience of all, direct communication of soul, that approach has left the music industry. So somebody like Ben Harper, who's just wonderful, is regarded as a platform for um, ginger ale commercials, because it makes money. Where's the soul? 
the soul is lost. And that is, that's a negative, that's an amputation for society at large, which depends on its entertainers for either soul or surface. And today it's all surface and no soul. I would argue the media industry is very much the same in terms of news, et cetera. I, I think you're right. Um, but there are, look, there are heartfelt um, things in the media. One of the things I ran across in all of my impeachment research is an article from, I think his name is George Con uh, Conley. He's uh, Kellyanne Conway's husband. And, um, and it's a 4,000 word piece in the Atlantic about the impeachment that just is riddled with human insight bursting with human insight. So you can find some very powerful things out there. It's just that they're not the things necessarily. I mean, look at our president. They're not the things I was about to say that are making headlines. Look at our president. All surface and no soul. He does have a soul, but it's predatory. It is a soul that shows no ability for compassion or empathy. It's a soul that delights in cruelty. It's a soul that's totally wrapped in dishonesty. And that's what American culture is all about? I'm sorry. That's, we cannot accept that. It's the troll economy, where if it bleeds, it leads, or if we can make you feel terrible, those are the things that get the reaction. How do we deal with that? Because those are the models that are currently incentivized by advertising and attention, which is the economy or the capitalism structure we've built the internet on. Well, the capitalism structure is based on our democratic impulse. In other words, the more people who view an article, um, the hotter it is, and the more that the bosses in charge who are looking at the bottom line want to follow the model of that which gets the greatest number of views. But it's our views, ultimately, that determine things. So how, I mean, look, if we understand that we are here to use all of our intellect and all of our passion at once to understand the world in the best way possible, that helps. Another thing that helps, at the age of 10, what converted me to science were two principles, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Look at things that you and everybody around you take for granted, that are invisible to you, and bring them into the light so you can see them. So these are the rules of courage, the truth at any price, including the price of your life, and awe and wonder. Look at things that are right under your nose as if you've never seen them before. All wonder and curiosity. If those two rules are applied, because those are not just rules for science, those are rules for life. We can get back to what journalism thought it was all about not that long ago, the truth. Um, you know, journalism, mainstream journalism slipped. Um, I chronicled many, many, many dishonest things that appear in the press, but it is not the fake news and it has a standard of fact checking. And we need to get back to the truth at any price, including the price of your life, and look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Can we do that without, in change, without changing the incentive model? For me, it's the analogy of if you wanna lose weight, the easiest way to do it is to get junk food out of your house. And if you have junk food under your house, you're always gonna, in, in your house, you're always gonna struggle with weight, just because we have the incentives of, let's try to survive by being as fat and having as many calories as possible because that's what evolution loves. Yeah, well, that's what evolution loves, but in fact, it's up to each of us to make a contribution in our area with the greatest amount of honesty, the greatest amount of passion, the greatest amount of authenticity we possibly can. Then we can't be sure that that is what's going to bring in the views, that that's what's gonna go viral. We can't be sure at all, but we do have to stick to our standards. We do have to stick to our principles. They are very important, and that's especially important in the totally unprincipled and anti-principled age of Donald Trump. Why did they choose you to cover the impeachment? Well, that's a good question. They call me the human computer, so they assume that they can call me 15 minutes before the show um, on absolutely any topic in the world, and I will have an answer. I mean, I think it goes back to once upon a time after I'd only done the show 80 times or something like that. They called one night, it was 11.30 at night, the show goes on at one in the morning, and said, do you know anything about Avatar, the movie? And I said, I don't know anything. And they said, well, there are these reports that the kids are committing suicide after seeing Avatar. 
And I said, I can explain that. Um, it relates to the phenomena that astronauts feel when they come back from space. They've been in space for two weeks or two months or a year, and they've been blissfully above all of the turmoil, problems, and politics on the face of the planet. All they've seen is one big united planet beneath them. And when they get ready to come back, they go into a depression because they're about to leave this blissful state and come back to all the turmoil, to all the problems, to all the petty dissensions. And it drives them crazy. It really hugely depresses them. Avatar, from what little I understand, is a movie that takes you into a visual paradise. So when you leave it, you're going back to all the petty problems of normal life, and that's hard. Um, so they had me on to talk about a movie I'd never seen and knew almost nothing about. So that from then on, they have assumed that they can call me about any topic from the world, the norovirus on cruise ships, um, the biome in the gut, um, the discovery of new exoplanets, anything. And, or, and any subject in politics or geopolitics at all. And I'll be able to talk about it. Well, in reality, it takes a huge amount of research. Um, and tonight I'm going on about um, how global warming, uh, something like 12,000 scientists have, have signed on to a statement that says that because of global warming, we have to curb the population of the Earth. Um, well, I'm going to have an easier time with that than I have with most things. Last week, they called about um, a, an extreme haunted house that takes you through a 10-hour experience and challenges you to make it all the way through to the end of the experience. And if you make it through to the end of the experience, you'll get a $20,000 prize. No one's ever gotten the $20,000 prize. And there was a petition against this haunted house to shut it down as being torture porn um, that gathered 70,000 signatures in two days. And they wanted me to comment on that. Well, that was an avenue to explaining what astonishment and extreme experiences accomplish for humanity and for the cosmos of all things. Because extreme experiences allow us to go beyond or go to the edge of our cultural perceptual envelope and push those edges just a little bit and bring the impossible into the realm of the normal, which is something the cosmos uses us to do. This cosmos constantly generates what I call supersized surprises. And she's using us as her feelers for ways to extend the limits of her possibilities right now. So my argument is this haunted house should not be shut down um, unless it's doing something criminal like sexual abuse, which it's been accused of. Um, so why do they want me to talk about virtually everything they've gotten used to thinking that I'm a universal resource? Well, thank goodness. What a wonderful thing to be. Um, it gives me an excuse to drill down to the details on many subjects that I would never touch. I think that's something we need to incorporate more in education, the ability to defend different viewpoints, because you have to put yourself in different ones. For instance, with a haunted house, I think that's probably a bad idea. It's similar to giving the serial uh, killers or shooters a platform. You see more gun, gun deaths happening in the U.S. because we kind of glorify it by putting you in the newspaper if you're kind of a loser that no one likes. And you oh, yes, absolutely. Your 15 minutes of fame, it looks like. The more 15 minutes of fame you get, the more people you're incentivizing to go for that fame. Same thing with terrorism, exactly. same thing with other things. Attention is the oxygen of the human soul. And um, so we will do anything for attention. Attention is more important to us than money. Attention is more important to us than sex. Attention is more important than anything else going. We have an attentiovore, a person who swallows attention in massive quantities, in the White House right now, totally motivated. Is, right. demo is right. democracy broken? Let's have the debate right now. Not yeah. all democracy, but at least democracy in the U.S. I would argue the two-party system that we have is des designed and functioning exactly as designed. Well, you know, once upon a time, look, it is possible to work across the aisle. I know. You know, I, I came up, I went to Maxwell Air Force Base in May and put together a $2 billion moon prize, a way to get to the moon. Um, inexpensively, using off-the-shelf technologies. And um, my, my original partner in this was a three-star general. Well, then another person was brought into the team, Newt Gingrich. And in fact, I was the one who had to pitch Newt Gingrich on this. I sat with my left knee up against Newt Gingrich's right knee, pitching him. 
And now Newt Gingrich, to me, as a liberal and a Democrat, is a monster. He's the man who broke American politics. But Newt and I, since August, have been working very successfully together. You can work across the aisles if you focus on the things you have in common and forget about your differences, at least for the time being. And that has to resume in the American political system. I do not know how to make it resume, but it has to resume. And this president has to be impeached for a simple reason. I mean, we could wait until the election, which unfortunately he will probably win. But, and we could decide it with the election, not impeachment. We have to make a strong statement that what this man stands for, lying and cruelty, is not the standard of an American president does not represent America's values, should not be a part of our constitutional system. The founding fathers took it for granted that when you got a lot of states, when you got individual states to vote on somebody, a conniver, a man of low talents, as, as the founding fathers put it, a man who thrives on popularity, um, could make it to the top of a state system. But that a man of that sort would be winnowed out when it came to all of the states voting together on a president. Well, it turns out they're wrong. I don't know what to do about that, except a fitness test of some sort for a president. Um, but See, I think that's a symptom, though. So let, let me play devil's advocate. The way that okay. the system is designed currently is winner-take-all. A winner-take-all system has to only have two parties, because when there's a third party, they come up and compromise with their morals for number one or number two so that they can join and overtake number one and kind of Julius Caesar him in the back. So you're always gonna have two systems. You're always gonna have two political parties. When you have two of something, the only thing that matters is for it to maintain itself. The only thing that would be worse than them becoming more extreme would be them becoming more like the other one because then you only have one party and you no longer exist. That is the death of the party, which is the death of the thing trying to protect itself. So the only way that you have something happening is they have to become more and more extreme away from one another because the only thing that differentiates them is the difference between themselves and the other. And that's a part of nature. I mean, you see it look, once but only, in a major, only in a majority rule system. So if you have a, if you have a real democracy, so I've, I've had some other democratic, not, um, I've had some other election researchers on the program and they say we have the worst, uh, we have the worst um, democracy system in the, at least the first world, I want to say most of the world. Most right. systems don't function on a winner-take-all basis. They fun function on some type of runoff where you can have multiple votes. So if, just in case my first vote for XYZ doesn't go through and I have number two, three, and four who are my backup candidates, et cetera, you can distribute your votes across. There's a lot of different ways of doing it, but by having only a, a one versus the other, you always have two teams that are fundamentally must be opposed to each other to be able to maintain their teamhood, so to speak. Well, it's been maintained that back in the days of Tip, what's his name, um, and, and Ronald Reagan, who used to have drinks together, the Democrat and the Republican, there was more comedy between the two parties and they were able to get things done together. Um, at the time, it looked like they were at each other's throats, but apparently they were able to get things done together. We have, we have some big projects that must be done in our bipartisan. The biggest of them is the real debt that we've been leaving to our children and their children. And that is the deterioration of our infrastructure. We have, if you go to Kuala Lumpur, which I've done, I've done two different programs. I created two different programs for Kuala Lumpur. One was um, the, um, the Asian Space Technology Summit, which I co-chaired and co-founded. And the other was called Reperceiving Leadership. Well, when you come back from Kuala Lumpur and your cab is driving on New York City streets, you feel that you're in the ruin of an ancient city because you've just come from a thoroughly modern city and now you are going over pothole after pothole after pothole past buildings that look like they're deteriorating because it's been so long since they've been cleaned. Um, we need to bring our infrastructure up to a 21st century and 22nd century level. And that's being totally deferred. Trump promised us that he would do that. He said he's the master builder. He's totally forgotten about it. But that's something on which Democrats and Republicans agree. And it's, it is in conformity with the Green New Deal. Um, if you do massive infrastructure projects, which we need 
replacing bridges, um, replacing roads, somehow making them much more futuristic than they are now. That creates tens of thousands or even a million jobs. And um, of course, right now, there are something like six million jobs that are empty and they can't find qualified people to fill them. But it can help employ the, those who are still unemployed. So it's something we need and it's something that could bring the two parties together. Unfortunately, it goes back to what you were talking about before, and that is uh, attention is the oxygen of the human soul. It's not something, infrastructure is not something that's going to go viral. And everybody is driven by what goes viral these days. And the president is the ultimate example of a man who has absolutely mastered the art of virality. And what does virality depend on? Not greedy capitalists. It depends on you and me and, and our views, uh, you know, the number of times we click on something. Um, and we do click on the president and an awful lot. I used to watch science shows in, when I was eating breakfast in the morning. I haven't been able to do that for three years because there's a new Trump headline every two hours. Um, and so I've just had to totally glom on to politics in order to keep up with it. And the, when Trump was about to take office, I had this sudden burst of what's called learned helplessness, where you just give up. Because up until then, I'd been able to fact check anything that I wanted in the news. Now, because the headlines were coming so fast, it was impossible to fact check. You can't fact check 12 things a day. Donald Trump tells 12 lies a day, according to the Washington Post count, which is now over 13,000 lies in total since he's been in office. Um, so we're, it's, it's a tension that drives everything, absolutely everything. Um, and we have to find a way to draw attention to basic things like infrastructure. A bridge collapse will do it. I was just going to say, some, you kind of need something catastrophic. That's the problem with the way we're wired in a lot of ways. And, and yes, the way we're wired, because a long time ago, in the 1980s, I was having dinner with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood and a bunch of other press people. And sitting next to me was Mary Campbell from the Associated Press. And Mary was explaining to me that one day she had been called out to the airport because there was a plane in trouble. I don't remember whether it was JFK or LaGuardia. And she was in her car racing to the airport. She could see the plane in the air. And she, in, in her internal voice was saying, please, God, don't let it crash until I get there. So if it bleeds, it leads was already operational 40 years ago. And 400 years ago, I mean, 200 years ago. I mean, look at the battle between um, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson for office. They were calling each other hermaphrodites. And strange things, they were throwing sexual accusations at each other. It was the dirtiest campaign you've ever seen. But dirt makes headlines. And even Thomas Jefferson and John Adams knew that. So uh, democracy is designed to work in spite of that. It's just that in the viral age, look what we got as a president. There is a problem here. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of issues, a lot of things we could unpack. Instead, I'm going to throw a curveball and change the attention, so to speak. Why okay. space? Why the fascination with space, with colonizing Mars, with going to the moon? What's the story? Well, the story is basically when I was 10 years old, nobody in the city of Buffalo, New York, my hometown, had ever wanted to have anything to do with me, including my parents, who were simply, they weren't cruel, it was just they were too busy for me. And when, and all of a sudden, this program came on, Tom Corbett's Space Cadet. Um, and I thought, oh, if there's no room for me, I didn't think this. My emotions did this. My emotions basically said, if there's no room for me down on here or on Earth, maybe there's room for me up there. So I've been following it ever since. But the fact is that the future is in space. If it's true that we are running out of resources on this planet, and I don't think that's true, but if it's true, the resources of space are enormous. Once upon a time, there was a poison ball of stone, a planet of astonishing climate change every three hours the temperature went up and down 88 degrees. Every three hours, every three hours, the planet went, any point on the planet's surface that you could think of, went from the toxicity of a flood of radiation to the equal toxicity of no radiation at all, total darkness. Um, and yet life grabbed hold of this planet, and over the course of 3.85 billion years, 
greened and gardened the place. The most hostile planet you can possibly imagine. Well, there are a great many hostile balls of stone hanging over our head, just waiting to be greened and gardened. And from the resources that come from a multi-planetary economy, this world and humanity and life are going to change dramatically. We are the vehicles through which life and ecosystems are going to make it to the other planets and learn to survive there and be fruitful and multiply and provide things that we never imagined before. So space is the future. Um, I landed in space for a peculiar reason. But space is a future beyond belief. A future beyond belief. I know you're a, you're a very prominent atheist, and I can imagine why. That kind of ties together space being a place beyond belief in the future of humanity. How do you think about big picture issues? Well, the big picture issue is what in the world are we accomplishing? Are we desecrating the cosmos? Should we have left this as a, a virgin ball of stone with uh, nothing but hostile surfaces? Um, should we actually have greened and gardened this particular planet? Um, why is, uh, what's progress? Does it exist? Even Jay Gould used to tell us the, that the progress is an artificial idea and it really doesn't exist. And yet there's progress. If you look at the history of the cosmos from the Big Bang until now, the cosmos did ridiculous things. It, it, it put together the very first things from a mere sheet of space and time. It put together the very first atoms 300,000 years later. It put together the first galaxies um, uh, approximately a billion years after that. The cosmos just does these astonishing, massive leaps upward. And we're a part of that process. So should life be, should life be restricted in, in a, a universe? of gazillions of gravity balls, balls of stone. Should life be restricted to just one? No, life is imperialistic and ambitious, and life is colonialistic, and we are the carriers. You know, there are other creatures who are just as good at research and development as we are, bacteria. They outpace us. That's why we have to keep racing them with our drugs. Um, and right now, bacteria know that, that we are not running out of resources. How can we tell? 12 miles beneath your feet and mine, bacteria are, are, are converting granite to life stuff, to biomass. They know that there are resources all over the place. One thing that we can do the grab that, that bacteria can't is break out of the gravity well, is go to the moon, is go if to we Mars. break out, do we want to go back to a gravity well, or do we want to live in space structures? I've heard it argued quite a bit that we'd want to do that and then just mine the planets. Both. Absolutely. We'd want to create these, they're called O'Neill colonies. They have 500, theoretically, they would have 500 square miles of territory. You can have parks and farms, and, and uh, you can walk your puppy dog. Um, you could have homes bigger than Bill Gates' home in these colonies. Um, we want both. We want, the, we want to farm Mar the moon and Mars, and we want to farm places in space that haven't been built for, the ha for life habitations, for biohabitations yet, the O'Neill colonies. Yeah, we'll have, our, we'll have our coal mine, so to speak, in space where you don't really want to live, but you can yeah, get plenty the, of resources from. Right, and the biggest proponent of that idea is Jeff Bezos, who thinks that we should take all of industry off Earth and, uh, and zone Earth for a petting zoo, um, where we maintain the, the, the multiplicity of species, um, species diversity, and where humans can live without uh, breathing in the kind of noxious gases that have been taking over in New Delhi over the last couple of days. It's a nice idea. It's a great idea. I think it will happen. I kind of agree. I kind of think he's also convincing himself of that to offset the other concerns that he's creating. If I'm building sort of something positive, I don't have to think about the negative consequences of what I'm doing. Well, look, I was in 1995, when he started Amazon, I was still stuck in my bed. It looked like I'd never get out of it again. What was it like living in your bed for 15 years? Let's, let's dive into that real quick. Okay, Matt, it's something I can't describe because it's a torture. Solitary confinement is a torture and all kinds of pains come creeping out of you for which there are no words in the English language. It is intensely painful. One day I got a call 
once I got my voice back, because for five years I couldn't speak a single syllable, um, and once my voice came back, I got a call from somebody who said, um, you know, well, uh, I don't normally do this, but uh, I've read both your books, and would you mind if I came and met you? Are you kidding? Your whole sense of self, your whole sense of uh, humanity disappears as if it were vaporized by an atomizer. And you only come together again when there's another person in the room, and you have another person in the room so infrequently that most of the time you are in this atomized, extraordinarily painful state. So of course I wanted to meet this guy. He turned out to be Richard Foreman, the god of avant-garde theater, a MacArthur Genius Award winner and an officer of the Order of Arts and Letters in France. But his coming out here to see me, because he came out several times, was a salvation. Because for at least an hour or two hours, it took me out of this nonstop torture chamber that my body and my mind had become. It is you never want to experience it in your life, and when you hear of a prisoner being held in solitary confinement, do everything you can to get him out because he's being tortured beyond endurance. Yeah, solitude is the, the perfect path to insanity. It sounds like you managed to avoid it, but I'm sure you got a little bit of it in the process, which has been helpful for you in the creative career. Right. Well, the internet saved me. Um, I, I took three years to realize I was going to have to have two computers set up next to the bed and have a little Chinese box that allowed me to control both of them from one monitor and one keyboard. And then I stopped trying to sit up and, um, and my voice gradually came back. Um, but because of the internet, I mean, that's the only space in which I could live with cyberspace. And so I made my life in cyberspace for the next 10 years. Thank God cyberspace exists. I don't know how I would have survived. I probably wouldn't have survived. Do you think we'll go post-physical and go into a virtual reality-like world where people move more towards that because it can be an easier existence? Well, we've always been in a virtual reality world. What I mean by that is you believe that the wall behind your head exists. But at the moment, it's a virtual reality. You imagine it because you're looking at me. Um, you're not looking at the wall. I can see that clearly. The wall is behind you. Um, so most of what we know as reality is virtual. The animals that we're pursuing for dinner, the grocery store we're going to for dinner. The woman that we uh, said goodbye to in the morning, she's not here anymore. She's not coming back until this evening. Um, so we, our mind is just populated with virtual realities, and it's been that way since humans have had consciousness. So this is not something new. It's an incredible extension of what we've had, of the virtual realities we've had, a phenomenal extension. And do I believe that we will be able to live in virtual realities? Well, before Second Life existed, um, a college in, in California wanted me to come and do a lecture, which I could do from my bed because it was in a virtual world. They had created a virtual park. Well, because I couldn't walk outdoors anymore, uh, once I had the keys to that park, you know, the passwords, I would go walking in there every day because it was the only way of walking I could have. And you know that people have made love in, in Second Life, people have had affairs, people have gotten married because of the people they've met in Second Life. That virtual world has done astonishing things, even though it's very dull, flat, and boring um, for people's lives. Things will get considerably more interesting with the virtual worlds that come later. And once we have haptic senses, um, and once we have what I call the ultimate chip, once we have a chip that doesn't have to be installed in our brain, but allows us to talk to the computer all the time with our thoughts. And that's coming. The primitive signs of it are in brain-mind interfaces that are being developed. In fact, Elon Musk is developing one of them. Yeah, the, the EKG technology is moving very, very quickly because you get so much data. The question is just parsing it. Right, exactly. So in a lot of ways, you remind me of Harry Seldon from the Foundation series, the psycho historian, the unified theory of everything. How do you think about yourself? Well, I think of myself as pursuing the grand unified theory of everything in the universe, including sex violence and the human soul. And I have this table of contents to my body of work, and it's called the grand unified theory of everything in the universe, including the human soul. And the last time I counted, it was 9,200 chapters long. And my task is to, before I die, to show you how it all fits together 
because my books are only the tiniest. I, uh, my seventh book is coming out in April. It's called Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. And it's about my rock and roll, rock and roll adventures of a science nerd. And yes, I'm trying to lay out a, a, a grand unified theory that will allow you to see everything inside of you and everything outside of you in a whole different way. Do you believe in a universal consciousness or something that ties the cosmos together? It sounds like you do. Well, I believe that the universe is vitally tied together. You and I are children of the Big Bang. Right now, the things that make you solid are protons, and those protons were born in the first instant of the Big Bang. So, and that makes you a cousin of stars and galaxies and stones that you trip over and the, the building materials used in the walls around you. Um, we're all cousins. Um, and I mean even inanimate things are cousins in the family of the Big Bang. And then there's the family of DNA that holds all living things together. But is there anything universal beyond that? No, no universal consciousness, except the universal consciousness that we are working very hard um, to create. Okay. Words, we are God. Um, if there is no God, or it is our job to do his work. God is an aspiration, um, not a real thing. He's a human aspiration. And deity is a power that resides in us or in someone else and we're running in their simulation? Well, it's a power that resides in all of us. Um, but individually, we can, we can crack its code a tiny bit and thus contribute to the lives of our fellow human beings, we hope. How do you think about the simulation theory and proponents that we are living in someone else's simulation, quantum or otherwise? Um, I think it's silly. Um, I, I <laughs> you know, once upon, humans, explain everything in terms of their technology of the moment. Once upon a time, people had invented this astonishing stuff. They'd invented ways to take mud and pack it together into a form the cosmos had never seen before, rectangles. The cosmos had never seen that on this scale at all. Um, and then use it to build entire cities. And they also used mud to make cups, uh, not really cups, but beakers, um, and platters and all kinds of things. So when it came time to coming up with the theory of how the universe had begun, they had a God who created man and woman, who created man in particular, out of mud, just the way that people were creating cups and, and uh, plates and bricks. Um, today, the mud for us is simulation in computers. So now we're imagining that Simulations created everything. It's silly. Um, the, the, the actual existence of this cosmos is far bigger than, and mightier than we can grasp, and trying to compress it down to the size of a few tools is a necessary thing, but to believe that it's the be-all and end-all, that's silly. I would agree in practice. I'm not sure if th theoretically or functionally it's correct, but I think mentally in terms of how we think about it it's much more beneficial to assume it's incorrect because you don't really get anything from assuming it's correct whether or not it is well when you have a girlfriend and your girlfriend complains to you because she sees you far more infrequently than she'd like um when she complains that you're just a, she's just a simulation in your head and the relationship isn't real well the relationship is real she's an independent person and you have to constantly update your simulation to uh, confront what she really is, what she really wants, what she really enjoys. Um, that the simulation is a tool to try to understand her, but there is a real her. And the extent to which she is unpredictable is a measure of the extent to which she is not just a simulation in your brain. I would agree, but at the same time, I can't even technically tell that you're conscious. I can assume <laughs> I can assume it, but that's kind of the that's kind of the caveat, the issue. So we'll we'll invent AI, we'll invent robots, and we'll shit. Is Watson over there actually feeling it when uh he has to go and cook my my dinner? It's a whole it's right. a whole nother problem, but it it's, certainly is, and it's a very interesting one, and it's one that hopefully science will be able to cope with uh, and handle and measure sometime in the next twenty years. It might be more beneficial if we're never able to, though. Some things are dangerous when you understand them because by taking away the mystery you take away the life of them once you have an algorithm to create a netflix movie we see the 
the Netflix movies get worse and worse and worse over time. There's a bunch of bad. Right. I mean, they're a bag of shit now. A lot of the ones they're putting out, they're like the six and five star rating ones. And it hits, it hits the formula. It hits the algorithm and seems to work for people, but there's not really something there. Well, I would never worry about demystifying the universe because every time we solve a problem, Every time we come to understand a mystery, it opens another 20 mysteries to us. It's a, it's a fractal. Everything's fractal. I think that's the takeaway yes. there. Yes, exactly. We're going to do the lightning round in episode today to have a little bonus for everybody listening. So bump, bump, bump. What, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten, Howard, and who gave it to you? Um, I was named the editor of a literary magazine at NYU, and I hated literary magazines. I looked perplexed, and somebody stopped me in a corridor at NYU and said, you look troubled, can I help you with something? And ultimately what he said is, if you could do anything you wanted with this magazine, what would it be? And that's the most important question. If you could do anything you wanted with fill in the blank, what would it be? And okay, then, that's my next question for you then. I'm giving you a magic wand to solve a problem in the world today. What would it be and how would you solve it? Oh God, I would try to solve the problem of a human conflict. Human conflict is human competition is fruitful as long as it stays within its bounds but when it either breaks down a society the way that it's breaking down our governance right now or it leads to war and it kills people it's monstrous so like every bluff-headed model that you might ever ask that question of i want world peace i like it we just have a slightly more realistic or educated way of looking at it what technology or trend are you most worried about and why um, I'm not worried about any of them. I think every one of them is a launch pad to the next step up. Um, I think that everything has its good side and its bad side. You know, a hammer can be used to kill or a hammer can be used to build a house. The Spartans actually outlawed hammers. Um, that was a silly idea. Um, we need to find the positive facet of every technology we come across and we need to mine that positive fa facet to the nth degree and use it to imagine the next step up. I would agree, but when you, that hammer suddenly becomes the size of a city or the size of a planet and everyone has access to it, I think it changes the, the dynamic slightly. It always changes the dynamics. Technology, look, we did, we're not the inventors of technology. Once upon a time, bacteria um, did something outrageous. They invented a way of kidnapping wiggles in wiggles. These wiggles are called radiation. They're called, we call them light now they actually managed to kidnap mere photons and pull them into the process of life, make them energizers in the chemical process of life. This was an outrageous technological leap. If there had been a god, surely he would have struck down these bacteria for their hubris. So that technology, which we now call photosynthesis, changed the world. So we are not the only inventors of technology by any stretch of the imagination, and I welcome the positive aspects of every new technology. Me too. As long as we're willing to discuss and try to work against some of the negative ones that we see on the horizon. Well, there's, a, there's a book of mine called The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism. And it says the Western system works on a balance between three elements, a dynamic balance, a dynamic tension. And those elements are government, um, private industry, and the protest industry. And the protest industry is a self-corrective mechanism. And having self-corrective mechanisms is exactly what you're talking about. Looking at the ethical implications of things um, and, and outlawing the criminal aspects, the criminal uses of new technology. That's very important. Amen. In a sarcastic way. And um, uh, next question for you. I want a bold contrarian 10-year prediction, something you believe that most around you don't. Well, I believe that we will set up farms on the moon. I believe that we can put in the first In 10 humans, years, you think? Yes, I believe that we can put the first humans on the moon by 2024, which is this horrible president's aspiration, um, his stated goal. And I believe that we can set up at least the first fragments of farming on the moon, of taking greenery beyond this one wall of stone within the next 10 years. And guys, if you're against clean meat, that's the only way you're going to be eating meat in space. So just <laughs> no, there is another way. There's a 3D printer right now at the International Space Station that will build meat out of animal cells. Oh, that's what I, that's what I meant. So basically, something that's uh, okay. lab grown or lab 
engineer. Right. Basically not taking right. a cow out back and shooting him in the head. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's, a, there's some interesting ways to do it. And now I have two last questions for you, Howard. Okay. First question, if you were 18 to 20 today, what would you do, what would you pursue, and why? I would do pretty much exactly what I've done. I would try to follow all of my curiosities. Um, uh, and that means just everything you become curious about. When I was 21, I wanted to become a sinologist, you know, an expert in China. At that point, China was still a backward country, and there was no hint that it would ever become as huge as it's become on the world stage. Uh, look, follow those, if you'll allow me to use the word, follow those fucking curiosities. Don't let them die. Um, and, and I would do what I've done. I've had the most bizarre, absurd adventures for a science thinker that I've ever heard of in my life. And it's great. It's fabulous. It provides richness of insight that is beyond belief. Derek Sivers has a great, a great quote or way of evaluating things. And it's fuck yes or no. And that's basically seems to be how you live <laughs> your life. Yes, well, that's terrific. Last like question that. for you. And you can't steal yeah. that one. I want a call to action or a quote for people, something to take away before you tell them more about you and where to find you. Well, there's the line with which I end my YouTube series. And it's, um, this is Howard the Humongous speaking for, to you from the future. It's your job and my job to make, which is pretty much what you said a little while ago. And yes, the future is in our hands whether we fumble it or not, even if we choose to fumble it, one way or the other, it's the people who have made the future are terribly fallible. They wake up in the morning and they feel of no use to anybody on the planet and get terribly depressed. They have zits and they think everybody's going to look at them as if they're a monster because of those zits. They make very strange sounds in the bathroom and hope that nobody ever hears it. Um, they are people just like you and me, Winston Churchill. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who saved Western civilization, um, all of the great heroes um, of the past, and even of the present, are people just like you and me, which means it's our job to make history. They wake up and put on their pants one leg at a time. Where can yes. people find you and learn more about you in the work, Howard? HowardBloom.net. It's B-L-O-O-M, like the flowers, the bloom, and the spring. Why Howard the hum Humongous? Because I make fun of myself all the time. I enjoy making fun of myself. I enjoy not taking myself seriously. The kid, the clown, the polymath. Thanks for coming today, Howard. <laughs> thanks, Matt. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. If you have, be sure to share it around with a friend. I know we have a big mission here of changing the way that society and humanity thinks about and builds the future. And the best way that you can help us with a massive high five, sharing it around or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts disruptors.fm slash iTunes. Until next time, fuck yes or no. Go figure it out and do it. <laughs> Cheers. That's wonderful, Matt.